okay. We'll use the extra time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And good morning to all of you in the cyber world. Welcome. Um, Nelson Church will be having its chicken barbecue the first Sunday in May. And the sign-up sheet, if you want chickens or, or meals, is out on the table. So please sign that, because it's only a couple weeks away. And other announcements, what else is going on? Annual congregational meeting next week. That's because we had two years worth. <laughs> and, and Mark, I expect to thank you because oh. I hate to roll change and I rolled tons of it. I was going to thank you because that was There you go. Thing. I was nice. <laughs> yeah, I almost took it home and undid it all. <laughs> I was in charge of to giving it to you. This was so tempting. <laughs> About sometime last month, when we all left, Fortunately, we had a meeting Monday night and caught it then, but obviously our water bill suffered a bit this month. So um, just help, everybody can help with this. If you think you might be the last one in there, just make sure it's off before you walk out. It's not a pro it's not something that happens every time. It's like a really rare occurrence that it's fixed, but once in a while it's fixed. So kind of help all of us who lock up and clean up and just wander around, make sure stuff's off. you're here for a meeting or anything make sure it's off before you leave thanks and not just that but <coughs> lights and make sure doors are locked and um, as far as the commode is concerned if you um, just press it down and let go it runs if you press it down hold it until this is the weirdest thing to have going online uh, <laughs> if you press it down and hold the handle till it swirls and quits it'll quit but just kind of hang around and make sure it turns off. If you've ever wondered how much water can go through a toilet in that amount of time from a Sunday when we leave here at noon to a Monday evening meeting, normally our church uses 100 gallons, which is nowhere even near the minimum, but that toilet running used 5,200 gallons wow. went through that toilet just from noon on Sunday to Monday evening, so we can't, wow. can't let that happen again. Wow, wow. But check them both. But check them both. Yeah, check, it, check anything. If the yeah. faucet's dripping, who knows? Check everything. Okay. Let's worship together. Please stand for the call to worship. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is it's like, like precious oil on the head, running, running down, down upon the beard, beard on the beard of Aaron, of Aaron running, running down, down over the, the collar. collar. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. Hymn number 108.
Okay, there is a video that I would like you to see. Um, you know, we don't even think about it because with our modern sensibilities, especially since women got the right to vote and all the other things, you know, the women's movement that happened in the 60s and the 70s, we don't even think about the fact that back in Jesus' day, women had absolutely no value whatsoever. Um, the apostles all, with the exception of John, ran and hid because if men had come to the crucifixion, they would have been arrested. Women could go anywhere or do anything because they were worthless. So they could come to the cross and watch him die. They could go and take care of the body later because nobody cared what a woman did. This is just something I think we need to remember who the first people were that Jesus appeared to after he had risen. So enjoy this. It's, it's a rather nice video. Early on Sunday morning, before the sun began to rise, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb to finish a painful task, the burial of her beloved Lord and Master. The pain and agony she must have felt as she mourned the Savior's death is beyond comprehension. As one of the Lord's most faithful and devoted followers, Christ's appearance to Mary that Easter morn places her as the first witness of the resurrection. Knowing Jesus was willing to reveal himself first to her gives us all hope that we too can testify of the Savior's divinity no matter who we are. Well known today as Mary Magdalene, she would have just been called Mary. She was from the city called Magdala, thus giving her the title of Magdalene. This ancient city on the northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee was quite prosperous and known for its fishing industry exporting salted fish, popular in Roman markets. In 2009, archaeologists discovered a beautiful first century synagogue lined with benches on the sides, colorfully painted fresco walls, a mosaic patterned floor, and a stunning one-of-a-kind stone-carved Torah reading table. Mary may have likely attended this synagogue. Jesus may have even taught here. The Gospels tell us that prior to following the Savior, Mary had been possessed by seven devils or demons. The scriptures give us no details of the story, except to say that Jesus healed Mary and cast out the spirits. Once tormented, Mary was now freed by the power of the Messiah. She devoted the rest of her life to following the Savior. Luke tells us that like other women, Mary helped financially support Jesus in his ministry. As one from Magdala, Mary would have likely had a successful business with enough wealth to help support the Savior. In short, after having known darkness, Mary chose to be in the light by becoming one of Christ's most faithful and devoted disciples. Contrary to later tradition, the scriptures give no evidence that Mary was a prostitute or the sinful woman who washed Jesus' feet. Sadly, Christians later wanted to find a place for sinful women and thus altered the story of Mary. Understanding who Mary is, let's now turn to the final 24 hours of the life of the Savior. According to the Gospels, after Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, the apostles fled and hid. John names only one male disciple at the cross, the beloved of Jesus, yet names several women who stood by his side, including Mary Magdalene. While other disciples fled in fear, these faithful women, Mary included, were willing to mourn at the foot of the cross to the very end. One can only imagine the absolute heart-rending pain they must have felt and the strength they had to muster as they became eyewitnesses to the Savior's agony and death on the cross. Despite all they had just seen and endured, 
The Gospels tell us that these women, Mary among them, then stayed to help and remove the lifeless corpse of Jesus from the cross. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus apparently were also there at least to help remove the body and carry it to the tomb. The Sabbath is now fast approaching. The women were not able to complete the full burial process. They would need to return to the tomb on Sunday, the first day of the week, to finish the heart-wrenching task. As they walked away from the lifeless body of their beloved master to begin their own day of rest, surely there would be little rest for Mary and these women. Before the sun had even begun to rise, Mary Magdalene was the first to arrive Sunday morning, followed by the other women, showing a sincere desire to care for the body of her Lord as quickly as possible. But the tomb was empty. The body of her precious Savior was gone, with what one can only imagine as fear and anguish filling her already broken heart. She ran to tell the disciples. After hearing the news, Peter and John came to see the empty tomb for themselves. As they entered, Peter found that the cloths that had been so carefully wrapped around the Savior's body were now folded and carefully placed on the stone bench. The apostles left, but Mary stayed behind. She weeps as she looks into the tomb and sees two angels sitting where his body had been so carefully laid. What sorrow she must have felt as she turned away from the last known resting place of her master. Someone had taken her Lord, and she knew not where he lay. Tears would have filled her eyes, making it difficult to recognize even the very one whose loss she was deeply mourning. Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Supposing the man to be the gardener and possibly the one who had taken away the body, she says, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Then Mary hears just a single word, her own name, Mary. Immediately she knows this is not the gardener. This is the Savior, her Savior. Powerfully, it was not by sight that Mary has recognized Jesus, but by hearing the Good Shepherd calling her name. She must have next embraced the Lord, whom she had just seen crucified and laid in a tomb. For he said, Touch me not, which is better translated from the Greek as don't hold me more, or you can't hold me forever. In this remarkable moment in history, Mary Magdalene has become the first witness to the resurrection of the Savior. The significance of Mary Magdalene, chosen by the Lord to be the first witness of the resurrection, can easily be missed. According to Josephus, a first century Jewish historian, a credible witness must be someone with a good past life, not a slave and not a woman. Here stood Mary, a woman, having been possessed of seven devils, not a credible witness according to Jewish law. Yet the Savior not only first appears to Mary, but also to several other women who likewise had come to care for the Lord's body. Before appearing to Peter, who would become the head of his church or of any of the other apostles, Jesus first appears to women. The very same women had personally witnessed the crucifixion and the burial were now witnesses to the resurrection of the Savior. In a world where women were looked down upon and not valued, this powerful story teaches us that Christ does not see us for our worldly credibility, status, race, or gender, but instead sees our level of faith and devotion to Him. In the darkest of moments, these women had stayed by Jesus, supporting him, caring for him, even burying him. Now they are the first to have seen his light. All of us have dark moments in our lives when we feel sorrow and despair. Like Mary who went to the tomb on a Sunday morning, expecting to see the dead body of the Lord, we too may feel that all hope is lost but that Easter morning, Mary found the living resurrected Messiah. 
He came to her just as the Savior comes to those who seek him. In those dark moments when all seems lost and our eyes are filled with tears, we too can hear our name, called by the Good Shepherd, who knows us like no other. He brings light and joy to overcome even the darkest of days. Like Mary, we too can be witnesses of the living resurrected Messiah. Like Mary, we too can tell all who hear of the glorious news of the gospel, He is risen. Christ is raised from the dead. Come and see. you please stand for the prayer of confession? God of light, you have called us into partnership, but we have chosen instead to go our own way. You have given us light, but we have preferred to walk in the shadows. You call us to truth while we cling to our lies. We try to fool others and end up deceiving ourselves. Come to us in our confusion, doubt, and sin to forgive us and make us whole. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus is our advocate, standing at the right hand of God the Father, the expiation for our sins and the sins of the whole world. In Christ, God welcomes us to an eternal life in which we are cleansed and forgiven. All who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb are invited to walk in his light, fulfilling the call to be Christ's body in a broken and fearful world. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Sunday morning I did something that a pastor never ever wants to do on Christmas and Easter. I didn't come. Um, oh my heavens. So I don't know how much Lori told folks last week. Um, so I'll just kind of fill folks in a little bit. Braden hadn't been feeling well for days. Just kept saying my stomach hurts and and that Saturday, the day before Easter, it just became a crisis, and he just, he was so sick. We were up Saturday night, went to bed, I don't know, 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. I got up to get ready for church. He was sleeping. And not too long before I left to go up to Nelson, he woke up, and he was still so sick. And I thought, I can't ask this kid to sit here three more hours like this. Um, so I called Lori and said, I'm going to do the Nelson service, but I have to take him to the ER. I have to. So she and Mike, God bless them, they ran up and grabbed the transcript for the sermon, and um, she, just, she just took it and ran with it and did the service and did the music and did... And Vicky, and I got online and, and watched because I heard people say Vicky's presentation of my sermon was, it was wonderful. For somebody to take someone else's manuscript just like that and stand up and preach it is pretty incredible. The young lady has a future in the pulpit. There is no doubt about it. Um, so they did testing, they gave him fluids, they gave him anti-nausea medication and sent, and sent him home, did a CAT scan, didn't find anything surgically that needed to be done. 
went to our doctor Tuesday who gave some different medications and um, made a referral to a pediatric gastroenterologist in Geisinger. His appointment's not till May 14th, which I just find appalling that you would let a child suffer that long. Um, so if the medicine keeps him stable, which is kind of like this right now, then we'll wait it out. And if it doesn't, then I'm going to get mad and I'm going to start making phone calls and see what I can do, of course, to get him in earlier and get this taken care of. But I thank you and Vicki um, for Easter morning, for what you did here. I appreciate it. And as we know more, I'll let you know. But right now, we're hanging in there. Okay, let's bow our heads. Father, a few minutes ago we watched a video and, and we shut all the lights out. And on this rainy Sunday morning, it was so dark and somber in here. And it took us back to what that Saturday must have been like when you were in the tomb. And it took us back to Easter morning before the sun rose and Mary went to the tomb and found it empty. What grief, what, what fear. We all know that when we lose a loved one, seeing them, touching them, being with them, be, having that closure is so important. And for those moments, Neither Mary or the other women or Peter or John had that. Suddenly, the one thing that they needed more, confirmation, that Jesus was there and had died, that, that confirmation to make it real, suddenly that was gone. And yet they still could not conceive that he had risen. And we wouldn't either, had we been there we would have wondered who stole the body and, and what they would do to the loved one. So in our darkness in this room this morning, it, it brought that sober sense to what the beginning of Easter morning must have been. We all feel those times in our lives, times of fear and worry and upheaval. Our culture is full of it right now. Between COVID and an uproar in our cities and in our government, it's a real time of uncertainty and darkness. And then there's illness and death and crises in our families and heartache that we don't talk about. It makes for a sober time. But then the sun rose. Not only did the sun rise up in the sky, but the sun rose. And all the world changed. And though we may look around day to day and see so much brokenness and darkness, the fact is that he is risen and he is loose in the world and it will never be the same. It is that which we proclaim. It is that which we believe. It is how we live our lives. And we pray, Lord, that in living our lives like that, that others look and are attracted to that light within us, to that light that shines through us. 
We ask your power in that. We ask that you strengthen us to do that work. Strengthen us to, to be seen as your children. Guide us, comfort us, protect us. And open the way for us to walk into the future with you. We ask it all in your son's name, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So the scripture has us still on Easter Day later in the day. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the word of the Lord. Humanity hadn't been kicking up its heels very long on earth before it all started. Eve was the first person, of course, the first to listen to something that God had to say and utter the words in one way or another, I doubt it. There they are in the garden together, she and Adam. She's trying to convince him to take a bite of that God-forsaken apple. And he's not at all that sure that he wants to go along with it. And look, he says, you know what the Lord said would happen if we did this. Yeah, I doubt it, she said. Ouch. Abraham and Sarah were next. God says, you're going to have a son. And they literally fall down on the floor at the ripe old ages of 90 and 99, laughing themselves silly. And they say to God, you've got to be kidding. I don't think so. And God says, well, I do. And for their giggles, God tells them to name their son Isaac, which means laughter. And then along comes the prophet Jeremiah, and prophets now, by their very natures, have a tough go of it as it is, but God pushed Jeremiah to the limit. He told him when the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar was in the process of overthrowing Jerusalem, he told him 
that it was a bull market and to go ahead and buy land in Jerusalem. And Jeremiah's reply was, you have got to be kidding. They will think I'm crazy if I do something like that. I'll be the laughing stock of Judah. But he did mean it. And as usual, God was right. And he wanted to prove to the people that someday they would be back in Judea again, that it would be their home once more. Well, <laughs> then there's Jonah. God tells Jonah, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And Jonah's reply was, You've got to be kidding. I'm not going there. And for his efforts, of course, he runs out of town, boards a ship, and ends up in the belly of a whale. And when he finally admits that facing Nineveh was somewhat more preferable than staring at a fish's rib cage, God spits him out, and he heads, not happily, but he heads on his way back to Nineveh. And finally, lest we forget, Christmas wasn't that long ago, there is the priest, Zechariah. God tells him that day in the Holy of Holies, Zech, old buddy, you're going to be a papa. And Zechariah's response is, you got to be kidding me. I'm too old for that. How are you going to pull that one off? To which God replies, no, I'm not kidding. And just for that, you're going to be speechless until the baptizer is born. Now, with a Bible full of history like that, why are we so surprised when the disciples, in much the same way, utter the same words? Mary runs back to them, breathless from excitement and fear, and says, I've seen the Lord, and what do they do? They hide out in the locked room as if nothing had happened. And finally, in spite of all the locks, he appears among them. And as soon as they see the wounds on his hands and his feet and his side, they finally believe it. Thomas isn't there. But when he finally comes home and they tell him the exciting news, he replies in the most famous case of denial in the Bible, I doubt it. I'll believe it when I see it. And a week later, can you imagine him living that week? A week later, Jesus himself says, See, I told you so. I got to thinking about it, and the year that this happened was 1993, so it's been almost 30 years ago. This was Braden's dad. And Robbie was six years old at the time that this happened. We were permanent campers at Footrest Campground, and it was the 4th of July weekend. We had walked up to the camper to the, the camp store and needed milk and bread and wanted some cookies, and all of us always got together and we played some really hot games of volleyball up there. Well. Little did we know that back at my camper, my Rob was being challenged by another little boy named Rob to a game of Bet You Can't. And you know how this goes, right? We've all done this. Bet you can't climb that rock. Mm-hmm, bet I can. Bet you can't throw that ball as far as I can. Uh-huh, bet you I can. Bet you can't drive your mom's car. Uh-huh, bet you I can. Got it? Okay, 4th of July weekend in a packed campground. I will never forget what came next. It is so vivid in my memory for all time. There I am at the camp store standing by a shelf with a pack of Oreos in my hand, and I'm looking at the other cookies that are on the shelf thinking, which, which one do I want when a 13-year-old young man named Craig comes running in the store. And he runs up to me and goes, Mrs. Densmore, Mrs. Densmore, Robbie's got the car. To which I, in full denial, because Thomas has nothing on me, 
looked at him and said, Craig, get a life. And I went back to looking at cookies. Now, very slowly what he had said to me came over me and I looked at him again and I said, what did you say to me? And Max, you'll get this because you and I love the Little Mermaid. You know in the movie, The Little Mermaid, where the sea gal, gal grabs the lobster Sebastian and beats him and says and yells, I said the witch is singing with a broken set of pipes. Craig grabs me by the shirt and he goes, I said Robbie's got the car. Well, <laughs> just like that, there is no more doubt anymore. Human doubt is as indelibly a part of our makeup as laughter and tears. And doubting the divine is an integral part of our faith journey, just as is walking in the way with the risen Christ. Some doubt comes from our desire to grow. It's the ants in the pants kind of doubt that we all get the good, healthy, questioning kind of doubt that ultimately leads us to deeper understanding and a, and a deeper faith. It's a kind of doubt that plagues you when it dawns on you that there are no easy answers in our faith. The lore of fundamentalism, whether it's Protestant, Catholic, or anything in between, is that everything is settled in doctrine and formulas and rules, that all the answers in faith are in black and white, that no questioning is encouraged. Don't think about it. I got a phone call the other day from a woman who wanted to know where the Presbyterian Church stood on the issue of sexuality, all kinds of sexuality, because you know, I mean, that's a huge issue right now. It's a broad issue with, with um, not only gays, lesbians, but trans now, and all kinds of other things, marriages. She wanted to know what exactly we believed, what our stand was, and I told her we didn't have one, and that didn't satisfy her. She wanted to know in black and white what we believed about sex. And I told her that sex wasn't black and white. And what we really believed was that we firmly believed in giving people the opportunity to talk and to discuss the issues and to decide for themselves what they felt the Lord was saying to them. And that we were here to love them and support them, whatever their decision was. And she said that wasn't good enough. She wanted black and white on a silver platter. And all I could give her were questions and doubts on a paper plate. Think about this. One day... Someone asked Jesus why he should be listened to since he wasn't trained as a religious leader. And Jesus said, my teaching isn't mine, but it's his who sent me. And then they went on to ask him, well, if that's the case, then how do we know that's true? And he replied to them, if any man's will is to do God's will, he shall know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking by my own authority. Hmm. Jesus didn't give them rules and reasons for what they were doing so that they could be intellectually sure of all the rules before they took the plunge to believe him. Indeed, he said, the only way to really find out whether or not what I'm teaching is right is to live it. Was the earth really round? Columbus had to go sail to find out. Is the Bible a book with authority and power? The only way you're going to find out is to read it. Can, Dom, can God redeem even the most painful and bitter experiences of our lives? Put your hand in his and walk with him and find out. 
only by doing the truth can its authenticity be established or denied. Only by looking our doubts square in the eye can we overcome them. Only by living in the way can that journey with Jesus make any kind of sense. Abraham said, I'll believe it when I see it. And God said, well, here, Abraham, father of nations, hold your son. Jeremiah told the town clerk, well, I guess I will buy that parcel of land in Anathoth after all. Jonah told Nineveh they'd better batten down the hatches. Zechariah got his voice back. Just in time to praise the Lord for the child who would prepare the way for the Savior. The one who was to come. And come he did. He came. He dwelt among us as a man among men. And he was crucified, dead, and buried. And on the third day he rose again from the dead. And when he came and dwelt with those huddled together in fear and showed them his hands and side, there was no room left for their doubts anymore. I pray that that same Lord will come and dwell within each of our hearts and leave no room for doubt anymore. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand for the affirmation of faith from the Confession of 1967. Wherever the church exists, its members are both gathered in corporate life and dispersed in society for the sake of mission in the world. The church gathers to praise God to hear his word for humankind, to baptize and to join in the Lord's Supper, to pray for and present the world to him in worship, to enjoy fellowship, to receive instruction, strength, and comfort, to order and organize its own corporate life, to be tested, renewed, and reformed, and to speak and act in the world's affairs as may be appropriate to the needs of the time. The church disperses to serve God wherever its members are, at work or play, in private or in the life of society. Their prayer and Bible study are part of the church's worship and theological reflection. Their witness is the church's evangelism. Their daily action in the world is the church in mission to the world. The quality of their relation with other persons is the measure of the church's fidelity. Each member is the church in the world, endowed by the Spirit with some gift of ministry and is responsible for the integrity of their witness in their own particular situation. Let's thank God with our tithes and offerings. The plate is in the back. You at home, you've heard me before. Make your choice as to who you'd like to support. But in response to God's love, support someone. Okay. God of all, who raised Christ from the dead, all that we have reflects your eternal love. As those in the infant church in Jerusalem brought gifts to those in need, so we too bring offerings as a sign of our commitment and concern. Accept them as our testimony to Christ's resurrection and use them so that others might find life. In his name we pray, amen.